بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today we shall begin insha'Allah with a new chapter on or with, with a new section on wills and inheritances. So first of all, what is meant by will? What is a will? So a will is to give the ownership of something to an entity or an individual providing this takes place after death of the person writing the will whether this is in wealth property or benefits and this word wasiya is derived from connecting to that person or that entity that a individual wants to give to after his death. What are the wisdoms of it? There's so many. Among them would be that people, when they're alive, they may be a bit careful over what they have, a bit stingy, a bit negligent. And Islam wanted to give us room to be able to give away something that would benefit us after death. So this is a chance to catch up even if a person had died, yet still he may have the possibility, the chance to make a difference by giving something of what he possesses. Now, when we talk about wasiya, will, most people think that this refers only to the financial aspects. So, I write in my will, I give X amount of money to this person or to that organization. That's it. And this is not entirely true. Wasiya can refer to keeping part of the wealth of the money to individuals. You make a will that they take care of your family, of your kinship, of your children, of the orphans, of uh, uh, how it is uh, spent, that is the wealth. And the greatest will of all is when you advise your heirs religiously. So most great wills contain an advice to the children, to the wives, not to mourn uh, in a sense that is haram, such as wailing and uh, uh, tearing the clothes or pulling out the hair, etc., expressing their sorrow and grief. This is all haram, this is wailing, and it's a major sin. Advising the children to observe Salat on time, to protect your legacy and name, not to cause problems with others, etc. And also, uh, um, you can have general ways of wasiya, where you ask, and this would be a recommendation, some say would be an obligation, that your daughter would be given in marriage by such and such guardians 
people whom you think that would take care of a good selection. Likewise, if you leave orphans, who would take care of them? Who would be their guardian and look after them and their wealth, among other things? So, in short, this issue of writing a will is mentioned in the Quran. It is mentioned in the authentic Sunnah. And it is the consensus of all scholars that it is permissible to leave a will. And we will come to whether it's permissible or mandatory or recommended or prohibited. In the Quran, so many places Allah says, Azza wa Jal min ba'di wasiyyati yusi biha awdain. When speaking about inheritances, about inheritance, Allah says, this division is done after a will or a debt to be paid off. And this is why the scholars said that there are four rights that must be taken from the wealth of a deceased. So the minute one of us dies, there are four rights. And they compiled it into the Arabic word tadum. T, in Arabic, the, the letter ta, dal, wow, mean. Tadum. So the first thing when a person dies is that we block his wealth. So no one has the right to take from his ATM, from his bank account, from his wallet, because this is now the heir's wealth, not the wife's, not the children. So the moment he dies, his financial must be secured. And the first thing to take from his wealth is the letter ta in Arabic, which is the beginning of tajhizu al janaza the preparation of the funeral. So if we need money to hire someone to come and wash the deceased body, if we need money to buy shrouds, if we need money to buy perfume, all of this is taken from his wealth. If we need money to buy a spot where we can bury him in, because some countries don't have public cemeteries that you bury people for free. They insist that you buy a plot of land or a family space where you can be buried in. So we have to take the money from his wealth. The wife and children say, no, 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 no. We, this is our money. We are the heirs. We need to divide the money now. Unfortunately, this is what happens after a person dies. Everybody, like hyenas, wild hyenas, they jump and want to take their share, which we will come to discuss later on, inshallah. So the first thing we do is take the inheritance, uh, take what is needed to prepare the corpse of the deceased. After that, we have the letter Dal, the D. And this is allocated for the debts. So before we give a penny to any of the heirs, we call out people. We check his will. If he had left debts behind, we have to pay them off. So one says, well, he didn't leave a lot of cash. In this case, 
we have to sell the property. But my mother lives in the house. This is not our responsibility yet. The deceased death meant that all of his assets must be allocated for these four things that we've just mentioned. First, priority, preparation of the funeral. Secondly, paying off his debts. So we sell the house, we sell uh, the plots, we sell the stocks, we sell whatever we can sell just to pay off his debts. And the debts are not something that are hearsay. So if I come and I say, listen, your father borrowed from me $100,000. Okay, uncle, we respect you. We believe you. But you have to have two witnesses testifying. We had no witnesses. Okay, then, uncle, we need a document proving that. We have no documents. Okay, uncle, Zakallah khair, this is the exit. You can leave whenever you want after drinking your tea. This is rude, I know, but this is not a charity organization. Anyone claiming that he gave money, we give him without proof and evidence. Otherwise, the whole neighborhood would come and claim that he borrowed something from them. So we have to pay off the debts. Ta, dal, wow. The letter W, which stands in English and Arabic, to will. After we prepared the funeral and paid for it, after we have paid off all of his debts, he still has money. Then we have to look into the will that he left behind. Either testifying two men about uh, uh, on that issue that I leave so and so to so and so, or he wrote a document and authenticated it with a signature or with a lawyer or something that is credible and legal and beyond doubt. So we execute the will as we will come and see, and, and see how to do that. Finally, the fourth right, which is meme, which is the heirs, the inheritance. Now we can divide the inheritance according to the Sharia law after all these rights were cleared with the grace of Allah. So when we come to the issue of will, what is recommended and what is haram and what is mandatory, what is uh, um, permissible, etc. So the permissible will is the one that when you have a lot of money and remember that this is a common note when we ever speak about will the will is recommended is needed when you have a lot of money and it becomes prohibited when you do it in means that are not permissible and it becomes makruh and not preferred when your money is little and your heirs are a lot so you have to always consider that Writing a will is when you have plenty of money left behind. Now, the first thing you have to pay attention to is that there is a limitation in terms of how much you can write a will for and in terms of who Two, you can write a will for. So in terms of amount, the Prophet ﷺ in an authentic hadith visited one of his great companions 
Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. May Allah be pleased with him. One of the ten heaven bound and he was so sick that he thought that he were going to die. And that was at the beginning of Islam when he only had two daughters. So he said, O Prophet of Allah, I am thinking of getting close to death. How much would I write a will giving away a portion of my money? Can I write two thirds? He said, no. Can I write a half? He said, no. Can I write a third? The Prophet said, a third and a third is a lot. So he approved that when you want to write, when you want to donate, when you want to give after your death, you're entitled to give away one third of your wealth. And he said that one third is a lot. This is why even Abbas, may Allah be pleased with the man with his father said, I wish people would write their wills not more than a quarter because the Prophet said a third is a lot. But the Prophet did not prohibit it. So a third is your limit. A third of what? A third of whatever a deceased left behind. And this is why we have to calculate the possessions and the wealth of the deceased before distributing it. So it's not sensible to just divide what he has in the bank account. And a few months later, we calculate how much is this and how much is that, how much stocks he has, if he had jewelry, if he had expensive watches. No, the thing is, you should calculate and estimate the value of everything he left behind. The plots, the house or houses, the cars, his clothes, the furniture in the house, his valuable personal things such as watches, pens, uh, cufflings, if he had stocks in different uh, companies, if he had bank accounts, if he had um, investments here and there, all of this is calculated. And then we look at the will. If he says, I leave one third of what I have to charity organizations, to Zad TV, to Peace TV, to Huda TV, or to the Islamic Center in West Virginia, or to a publication that publishes Islamic knowledge and information for free or for taking pil poor pilgrims to perform Hajj every year, etc. Whatever. This has to be executed as he wished. So one third is the max. Now, when we come to the types of wills, we have a will that is recommended. What is that will? It is a will where I write that after my death, one third, one quarter, I always drop the mic, this or that um, much to be given out after my death. Why do we say this is recommended? Because if you have a lot of money and after giving away one third, your children will still be very, very well off, then it's best that you benefit yourself. Remember that the Prophet said in the hadith of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, after he told him that a third is a lot, he said, it is best for you to leave your heirs well off than leaving them begging people for money. So yes, giving money away in means of charity is good, 
only if you have a lot of wealth that would not require your children to beg after you. Now, will can be mandatory. And this is logical to most people. When is a will is considered to be mandatory? Either when there are rights related to me or there are rights related to others. Kindly explain. I will do that. Rights related to me, such as I was negligent. I did not perform Hajj during my lifetime. So I allocate an amount to be taken so that after my death, people would perform Hajj on my behalf. Am I sinful? Of course you are. But this is the least you could do. Zakat money. I feel that I'm going to die soon and my zakat is due in maybe like a couple of weeks, three weeks. I don't know if I'm going to be around to pay it. So I have to write a will saying that my zakat is on the 1st of Muharram. And if I die, calculate it if I die within the period and give it out on my behalf. Expiations. I swore and broke my oath a couple of times. I need to feed 10 or 20 poor people or Allah knows how much. And I didn't. So you write a will that they take money and give it to your expiation. Above all, if I have debts towards others, now, this is, these are rights related to others. So I borrowed 100,000 from my best friend. I didn't write a paper. We didn't have witnesses. And I know that if I die and he comes asking for his money, my children will say, Uncle, with all due respect, drink your coffee and leave. We don't, you don't have any evidences. How can we believe you? So it's a must upon me to write a document stating that my best friend had given me a hundred thousand and you have to return it back to him. Likewise, if I gave my best friend a loan or someone else or my uncle, so I have to write down because this money now belongs to my heirs. If I have documents to support it, Alhamdulillah, if I don't, then it's my word after death against his and the judge would ask him to swear by Allah that he did not borrow anything from me and then he's off the hook in this world but in the day of judgment may Allah make it easy for all of us so this is all part of the mandatory will some scholars and they are a minority they looked at Allah's verse stating prescribed for you when death approaches anyone of you if he leaves wealth is that he should make a bequest for the parents and near relatives according to what is acceptable a duty upon the righteous so near relatives have rights the vast majority look at this ayah and say that this was abrogated some scholars say Allah said prescribe for you kutiba alaykum which is mandating it so there are a number there is a number of scholars that say that this is not abrogated it's mandatory if you are rich Condition one, two, and you have near relatives who are not heirs, who will not inherit you, like cousins, uncles, etc., who are poor and needy. It's a must that you leave them something behind in your will. But it seems that the majority of scholars are correct, and this is abrogated. The third type of inheritance is the unrecommended 
the one that is not preferred. And we gave an example when a person has little money. So he's, all what he has is $500. All what he left behind in his bank account is $500. And he has six children. So he wants to donate one third of it in his will. Mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, was asked, a man having an X amount of money, which is little, and six children, what will should he write? And she said, he should donate the money to his six children. It's not a donation. They will inherit it. Meaning that he should not at all write it as a will because this is unfair to the children. And finally, it can be haram. A will can be prohibited. And when is that? A will can be prohibited if a man increases the amount of money to exceed the third when he knows that the Prophet said that you have only one third to give away. And how is that? So I, I come, if I, especially in countries that give precedent and give a priority to man-made law. So if I'm in the States and I write my in my will that I leave all of my wealth to my dog or to the Islamic Center or to this or that, by law they will accept this and they will give all the money to whom I designated it to in my will. In Islam, this is totally haram. This is prohibited. I can only give one third. So in a Muslim country, the Muslim judge would look at this will and only allocate one third of my wealth to that person or that area that I had designated it to, but not the whole thing. So it's haram to give more than one third. It is also prohibited and haram to write in your will something for one of your heirs. And this happens a lot. So I have wealth and I write in my will, in my will that the house I live in would not be divided by the rules of Sharia. Rather, it is belonging to my wife and I give it to my wife. This is prohibited because your wife, by default, if you have children, will get one eighth of your property. And if you don't have children, she'll get a quarter of all what you possessed. To come and add something to that, more than what Allah has legislated, that this would be a transgression and it is prohibited. Now, some books of fiqh go into details and some of these details have evidences to back them up and some are just ishtihad this is what the scholars came up with for example they said that there are conditions that the testator the one who writes the will he has to have conditions and this is acceptable he has to be an adult he has to be sane he has to have a sound mind does he have to be a Muslim nope so even a non believer a disbeliever can write a will and it should be executed there's no problem but again his will must not exceed one-third because Allah ordered us to rule with our Sharia over such matters. So the testator has to be an adult, sane, sound mind, qualified to make a donation 
owner of things. I cannot write in my will, I give my neighbor's house as a gift to an Islamic organization. I don't possess his house. How can I write a will when I don't possess it, when I, when I don't own it? And it has to be from a person who can donate. So if I were a slave, I cannot write a will giving anything away because all what I own belongs to my master. And some scholars said that if a child who's in his sound mind and is able to choose, but he's, he did not reach the age of, a, a, of puberty, if he writes a will, for example, to take care of what is needed to, to be taken care of, it is valid. But this is redundant and this is elementary. So if a child says, in his will, take from my money after I die, such and such, so that you can prepare my body for burial and to buy shrouds. And this is done without saying. But if he says, take from my money one third and give it to the masjid of dispute, is he entitled to give while he's alive? The answer is no, because he does not have the sound mind to do so and to do the right choice. Likewise, they said if someone was weak in his mind and he makes a charity, it should be uh, uh, carried through. And again, this is an issue of dispute and we don't know sound evidences backing it up. And it could open a lot of um, doors that are not needed. So the conditions, again, about the person writing the will, the condition of the recipients, the beneficiaries, that they are not any of his heirs. I cannot write a will to my parents, to my children, to my wife. They're all inheriting by default. So any will I write to them would be ignored. Of course, we mean financial will, a portion of my possessions. But if I wrote a will advising them to fear Allah, to abide by Islamic laws, etc., of course, this is yeah, I mean, uh, um, valid and accepted. Uh, what else? One of the ways of bypassing some of the difficulties, such as if my parents are disbelievers, they know that when they die, I cannot inherit them. So they would like to write a will. I tell them that this is acceptable. If I write a will for you after my death, or you write a will for me after your death, be uh, as long as it does not exceed one third of your um, uh, wealth. This is permissible and Allah Azawajal knows best. Uh, we move on to the, the questions. So we have Najiba says, is it okay? My girl's 10 and 8 years old playing with boys in school. I do teach them not to play with, but they are kids. 10 and 8 are usually young. So if they're playing with same age of boys, Inshallah, this is uh, um, tolerable, though it is highly recommended that you immediately take the 10 year old out of school and put her in an Islamic segregated school. This is the age where their eyes open and boys in their 12 and 13 years get the age of puberty and it is not safe. I have seen girls in the US and in Europe 
who reached the age of 12 and 13 and were pregnant. So it is something to be scared of and you have all the right to fear for your children, but you can't put fuel next to fire and ask it not to ignite. This is what happens in mixed public schools and you have to do something about it and Allah Azza wa uh, knows best. Saud Habib says, one last question, please. To me, it's the first. While combining prayer, can I pray Isha first, then Maghrib? If Isha time is coming to end very close to midnight, so one decided to pray first Isha, then Maghrib? I am presuming, Saud, that you have a legitimate reason for delaying Isha this long. So, if you delayed Maghrib intentionally without any legitimate reason and came to the end of Isha time and wanted to do this, yes, this is permissible, but you cannot pray Maghrib. Maghrib is gone because you delayed it until the time came out without any legitimate reason. But if a person went to bed after Asr, he was so tired, he was sick, he was this, he was that. Only to wake up at 11.15 p.m. Skipping Maghrib and Isha. Knowing that Isha time ends at 11.25. So he has 10 minutes to offer a prayer. We, in this case, tell him pray Isha first. Then make up for Maghrib. Because if you prayed Maghrib, which has already been missed and you're making it up, this will make Isha being made up as well. So to minimize the losses, you're instructed to pray Isha on time because the time is still due. And afterwards you pray Maghrib, which is to be made up whether at the time of Isha or afterwards, it doesn't make any difference and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Roseanne says, what should be recited in Sajdat al-Sahu? All types of sujood, whether Sajdat al-Sahu or Sajdat al-Shukr or Sajdat al-Tilawah, recitation, you recite what is normal. Subhana Rabbi al-A'la wa bihamdih or Subhana Rabbi al-A'la alone. This is up to you. If you want to add afterwards something that might be prescribed from the Sunnah, there's no problem. In regards of sujood al-Sahu, there isn't anything prescribed for you to recite except Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. Nida says, does thunder or storm bring any form of evil with it? I don't know if we had answered this question before, but the answer is, this depends. If Allah wanted that storm to be a torment to a nation or to a person, then it has some torment in it. And if not, then it is to intimidate people to fear Allah Azza wa Jal. And it can be a blessing. It was reported that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, may Allah have mercy on his soul, was in Hajj one day with the Khalifa of the time. I think it was Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik or Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, I, I don't remember. And there was a thunderstorm and everybody was so afraid. Except Umar was smiling and, and having a good time. So the Khalifa asked him, why are you smiling? He said, Subhanallah, Allah Azza wa Jal tells us about this rain to be the signs of his mercy. And people are intimidated and afraid. This is Allah's mercy coming to us. So this is, again, depending on the person's positivity and negativity and how he reacts to such things. So I hope this answers your question. Abdul. Abdul Ikram, Ikram is not one of Allah's name. 
So you have to change your name. Ikram says, um, is it sinful to watch news channels with star with music? So I will presume that the news channel has anchors and you're talking about female anchors or they're interviewing stars, artists, actors and actresses, etc. And there is music. Music is prohibited for you to listen to. And watching such stars and celebrities tarnishes your heart, fills it with darkness, and it might kills it. Looking at these actors and actresses and singers and performers and entertainers, this darkens your heart and takes you away from Allah. These are people of sin. They endorse it. They publicize it and they uh, they advertise and ask people to come and join it looking at them would reduce the amount of iman in your heart without any doubt maya maya says what is the ruling about photography photography is an issue of dispute in a nutshell taking photographs of men and children beyond or below the age of puberty is permissible. Taking pictures of women without a legitimate reason and keeping them, saving them is prohibited. Hanging pictures of anyone, living creatures, is prohibited. And Allah Azza knows best. Ikram says, what if I ask dua by raising hands after dhikr? Well, salat is a form of worship. Dhikr is a form of worship. Dua is a form of worship. Where do we learn our forms of worship from? From the Prophet ﷺ, which means that any innovation in religion is rejected and not accepted. This is why scholars say that we cannot maintain a form of worship that the Prophet did not do. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Muhammad. The Prophet prayed and the Prophet ordered us to make dua while in sujood in our prayer and after the salutation, before salam, in our prayer. After salam, he ordered us and he showed us how to do dhikr. But there was no dua. So those who insist on raising their hands and making dua after every fart salat, we tell them that this is wrong and this is an innovation. <coughs> Zahra Jinaline Amador Obelgar says i'm a revert to islam my husband was a born muslim but he was not practicing and he does not like to live in the law of islam i want to live by the law of islam what should i do this is too generic zahra because when you say that he doesn't want to live by the law of islam did he commit an act of apostasy did he declare that he doesn't love Islam? Did he abandon Salat? Is he now a non-Muslim? If the answer is yes, you cannot stay with him. You have to immediately leave the house and apply for a separation based on these facts, that he's an apostate, he's not a Muslim. If he still pretends to be a Muslim, you have to apply for khula. And we've talked about the rules of Khula. Abu Nurhana says regarding the Salah, social distance, which is not mentioned in the Quran or in the Hadith, but currently doing now in the world for Muslim countries, as mentioned, that is an innovation. And due to this new Jama'a Salah procedure 
in not is not mentioned in the Quran and the Hadith. So I did not pray in the masjid. Is it possible that I pray in home with my wife and children until back to normal? Uh, the Salat in the Masjid. This is an issue of dispute. We discussed this so many times. Some scholars say that praying with the social distancing and the mask is better than abandoning the Salat in the Masjid. So in order to keep it active and working, we have to do that. Other scholars say that this is an innovation and the need for such social distancing is not urgent. It's not like when a person is infected with black plague, for example, that would kill him in four or five days. We can see that if someone is having leprosy or uh, uh, someone who is active, contagious and is sick. Yes, Islam tells us stay away from. But never ever we found the fear to exceed what is actual now what the who is telling us is that we have to fear seven billion inhabitants of earth and assume that they are infected and this is insane to come and instruct people to wear masks and to keep social distancing when others are normal said yeah they're normal but they might have a um, a virus one of them one of a thousand one of a ten thousand one of a million and how would i live for the rest of my life after this the who tells you only to look at the tip of your nose countries that are enforcing social distancing and the likes enforcing they're doing this because of their failure in accommodating the ICU cases. They don't have capacity. Not that they think that this is a necessity. They're afraid that they will reach a level where they cannot accommodate all of these infected. If you look at the fatalities and measure it to the rate of infected people, you'll find that it's less than 2%. So 2% of the population dying is not a big deal. In order for the economy to move on, in order for the people to pray in masjids, in order for them to resume their normal life. But when you scare the heck out of them and you make people live in fear, intimidated, tomorrow they announced that COVID-19 is gone forever. Do you think that the WHO would allow people to go without masks, without social distancing? Hmm. I doubt it. So I'm, I'm, I'm against the theory conspiracy, but I'm at the same time against dismantling Islamic law due to this. No handshakes. Okay, this is part of my religion. The Prophet tells us whenever we handshake, our sins fall like leaves of trees. No hugging when someone comes from abroad. Maybe he's infected. No eating from the same plate. Akhi, this is Sunnah. The Prophet said the barakah is there. He said, well, that was at the time of the Prophet. There's no barakah anymore. A'udhu billah. Are you Muslim? Jay, we have to be careful. We have to take the means. Take the means when there is a real need for that when the someone is sick in front of me but to assume that he's sick and i'm not doing this I said yeah, yeah this is the best thing uh doctor's advice what about my wife isn't there a possibility that she's sick as well why not cut us from one another and not let us meet what about my children living in the house said, no no they live in the house it's okay who said it's okay? Maybe they went out and brought it back to me. So this is not logical. Using the miswak, if I have a miswak, definitely the doctors would say, don't use miswak. It was exposed to air. So what do you want me to do? Keep my mouth shut? Not breathe? This is 
too much and I can go on and on in Islamic tradition where it goes head on against what the doctors are telling us because it is not a fact. Yes, this is a patient. I wear my mask. I don't shake hands. I stay away. But to assume and presume that the 100,000 other people who are totally healthy, they, can, they may be infected. No, I believe that this is uh, too bogus. So what to do? This depends on the person, individual. If you feel okay with wearing the mask and going to pray in the masjid because you love the masjid and you're afraid that it would be abandoned and, and, and boycotted by others, just go ahead and do that. If you feel that this is an innovation and you can't pray with mask on, you feel like a muzzled dog, as some people said, and you prefer to pray with your children and wife, this is inshallah permissible. When it comes to Friday, you have to pray in the masjid, even with the social distancing, because this uh, missing or skipping at three uh, Fridays in a row would seal your heart and Allah knows best. Afridon Hamru says, I have a friend whom I love for the sake of Allah. He is a very good Muslim. Sometimes when he makes an obvious mistake, I remind him that this is wrong, but he doesn't accept his wrongdoing and gets so offended that changes his attitude with me for a long time. What kind of relation should I have with him? Well, first of all, this is too generic again. I don't know the kind of mistakes you're talking about. I don't know if you are right and these are true mistakes or you're assuming or you're choosing the safest opinion. Secondly, it is obvious that you are a bit controlling because we all have friends and relatives that we tell them that this thing is wrong and we move on. We don't persist and insist on them changing immediately or raising the white flag, accepting their guilt and shortcomings. Now, this is not right, the right thing to do. You gave an advice, move on, khalas. You've done your due diligence, you've done your duty. But to insist that every time you see him, you did not change. You did not stop what I told you is haram. Why are you doing this? Are you a hypocrite? Nobody accepts this, sahih. So if you are the type that I've just mentioned, maybe it's best, best to take a step back and relax a bit and stop doing what you're doing. Because I, could, I would not blame your friend for um, yani avoiding you. And Allah knows best. Rabia Ahmed says, I'm, am I allowed to make a simple and single dua without adding dua of glorification to Allah and without the salutation to our beloved Prophet alayhi salatu the answer is yes. If I want to ask Allah, oh Allah forgive, forgive my sins, no problem. If I want to say, oh Allah pay off my debts, no problem. I say, oh Allah, my car is not working, let the mechanic find what's faulty and fix it with the cheapest cost possible, no problem. However, praising Allah and offering salutation upon the Prophet ﷺ would make your chances of getting answered more likely. For one incident, the Prophet entered the Masjid ﷺ and he heard a man making dua. And he said, this person is hasty. And he told him that to make dua, you have to praise Allah and then offer salutation. And in another hadith, the Prophet said, والسلام, the dua is blocked between the heavens and the earth until one offers salutation upon me. So when you make a single dua, like you have just mentioned, 
and you do not praise the Prophet uh, praise Allah Azza wa Jal and offer salutation upon the Prophet your chances are less in getting your dua answered and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. This is all the time we have until we meet next time on Monday. I leave you fi amanillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.